And we are live. Hello, welcome everybody to our very first Neuro Book Club. Uh, I am Adrienne Fairhall. I'm a professor at the University of Washington and director of our computational uh, um, neuroscience center. And my co-host is Tim. <laughs> You're muted. <laughs> I was just saying, Grace is making a face already, and then I realized I was muted. Um, it's my delight to be here too. Uh, my name is Tim Vogels. I'm a professor at the IST Austria in or near Vienna. And it's my delight to introduce to you today, Dr. Grace Lindsay, uh, the author of the book uh, that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, as a disclaimer, I would like to say, I'm a total amateur at this. So um, as a host, I might screw up several times. I'm sure that Grace won't screw up, so it's, uh, her that will be saving this. Um, I met Grace actually the first time 10 years ago or so, Grace, uh, when she was a undergrad researcher or something like that in Freiburg. Um, and uh, I met her because she made snark remarks and essentially made fun of me. Um, I was visiting as a postdoctoral visitor um, and it was, it was quite memorable and quite nice actually. I felt um, right at home. Um, and since then, Grace actually continued on uh, to go to Columbia uh, in, and was a grad student at the Theory Center uh, with Ken Miller and has only recently or maybe a year ago or so uh, switched uh, to the Gatsby where she's now with Manish Sahani, uh, a postdoctoral fellow at the, at the Gatsby uh, and where she's uh, finished uh, this lovely book that we're gonna hear about today. Uh, before I give the stage to Grace, I just wanted to let you know that uh, we asked Grace to give us a quick introduction uh, to talk about the book, um, how it came to be, uh, what she wants to talk about, and then she's going to give us a little reading. Uh, uh, she chose, uh, I think, a chapter of her uh, liking to bring the book close to us. And after that, we're going to uh, ask her a few questions uh, that we came up with when we read the book. Um, and a few questions of yours. If you want to join us on stage, that would be lovely. Uh, we're gonna call you up and bring you on stage if you ask questions in the question box. Uh, if you want to participate in the raffle, I should say there is a button at the bottom of the screen that you can add your name into. And um, Panos Bocelos, who's uh, the organizer of and, um, uh, and uh, founder of Worldwide Neuro is in the background and he will run the raffle uh, after about half time. Uh, to determine who gets the free signed copy. Um, and then uh, if we're lucky, maybe Grace will uh, finish with another uh, little bit of her book uh, before we go into the Monday evening that is rather uh, nice and warm in Vienna right now. Uh, so without further ado, Grace, it's a pleasure that you're here. Uh, thank you very much for joining us um, to read from your book, uh, The Models of the Mind. Thank you. I'm very excited to be the inaugural member of the book club. Um, yeah, so I guess speaking about how the book came to me came to be, um, you know, there's a process in terms of actually uh, getting a, a book deal and all of that, but um, kind of focusing on why this topic for a book. Uh, basically, I don't know how everyone in the field of computational neuroscience feels, but for me, I felt like if I told someone that I was a computational neuroscientist, that there was no response. <laughs> there, people didn't know what that was. It wasn't a thing that you could say that you were. It wasn't, there wasn't anything to point to in society. If someone wasn't a scientist, it'd be like, oh, you know, it's kind of like that or whatever. Even amongst neuroscientists, especially when I really was getting started in computational neuroscience over 10 years ago now, um, the computational side wasn't so... It, it didn't seem to me that it was so well known or well understood. Um, but at the same time, once you're in the field, um, it, there's so much that is kind of computational neuroscience that could be called computational neuroscience. And it's actually been a part of the history of neuroscience for so long that it seemed like it would be nice for there to be something that represented that field um, to a general audience. And so what the book is essentially is kind of the story of computational neuroscience or the stories of computational neuroscience because it's multifaceted and uh, there are many different ways that mathematical modeling and, and mathematical methods have worked their way into uh, neuroscience as a field. Um, but so the book 
uh, each chapter is almost a standalone kind of historical essay on a particular topic in uh, neuroscience and the mathematics that is used to model and understand that. So it starts with single cell models and builds up to population models like the Hopfield network for memory, models of visual processing, and on to even more kind of psychological behavioral models um, like Bayesian perception and reinforcement learning. And um, so it really kind of goes from, you know, cells to consciousness, um, just because that's, that's what computational neuroscience is. There isn't a specific type of neuroscience that needs computational methods more than, than others. You can really see the influence of computational methods throughout the field. Um, and it really is kind of the story in the sense that it traces the history. So some of these topics go very far back um, into history. I think we have the sense that computational neuroscience is like a modern part of neuroscience. And insofar as it's being, you know, called a, a single field or kind of condensed around certain conferences and that kind of thing, perhaps it is somewhat new. But certainly mathematical models have existed in, in neuroscience for a long time in various forms. And so um, it was really interesting to me to, to be able to dig into that kind of history and piece it all together to create coherent narratives for each of these different topic areas. Um, and uh, one of the fun bits is also just the interactions, you know, between different fields. The subtitle of the book is how physics, mathematics, and engineering have shaped our understanding of the brain. And, you know, in some parts of the history, that's just because people at that time were trained in all those things at once. And so it wasn't even an interdisciplinary field to apply some knowledge of math or physics to the brain. And then at other points, it really was an interesting, um, there are interesting anecdotes of just people from other fields just popping over to neuroscience um, out of interest or whatever other reason and um, really shaping the way that a certain topic in neuroscience has been thought about mathematically. Um, so yeah, so the book, as I said, kind of started as a means to explain this field to an outside audience. It is, you know, a popular science book. It's supposed to be accessible to anyone with an interest in this topic. Um, but as I was writing it, I kind of felt more and more how useful it was for me as a neuroscientist to, to learn this history and just in general to learn about the history of science because it kind of puts your own work in a different lens. If you think about, oh, you know, not so long ago, even people had a vastly different understanding of a certain area or whatever. And you think, well, how are we vastly misunderstanding something right now? Um, it's kind of interesting to, to reflect on that as you learn about the history of science and just to see kind of the personal side of how things got done and how sometimes, especially with these interdisciplinary connections, sometimes it is personal relationships that lead to um, a develop development being made where you have, you know, someone with more ma mathematical training meeting someone who's more on the biology side and they get something really interesting done. Um, yeah, so all in all, I just kind of, in the end, I hope that this is a useful product, both for the field of computational neuroscience as something to point to for like, if your friends or family don't know what you do, <laughs> they don't understand what it is. This is uh, something that you can point to. Um, and also just, uh, you know, a resource for our own history for people that are in the field. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of what the book is about and how it came to be. Um, and what I hope that it will be for people. Um, so I can do uh, a reading now. I was just going to read from the first uh, chapter of the book, um, just the first few pages. And so the first chapter is called Spherical Cows, What Mathematics Has to Offer. And it's just to explain to people why we would even consider using mathematics to try to understand something like the brain. <coughs> Excuse me. The web-weaving spider Cyclosa octotuberculata inhabits several locations in and around Japan. About the size of a fingernail and covered in camouflaging specks of black, white, and brown, this arachnid is a crafty predator. Sitting at the hub of its expertly built web, it waits to feel vibrations in the web's threads that are caused by struggling prey. As soon as the spider senses this movement, it storms off in the direction of the signal, ready to devour its catch. Sometimes prey is more commonly found in one location on the web than others. Smart predators know to keep track of these regularities and exploit them. Certain birds, for example, will recall where food has been abundant recently and return to those areas at a later time. Cyclosa octotuberculata does something similar, but not identical. Rather than remembering the locations that have fared well, that is rather than storing these locations in its mind and letting them influence its future attention, the spider literally weaves this information into its web. 
In particular, it uses its legs to tug on the specific silk threads from which prey has recently been detected, making them tighter. The tightened threads are more sensitive to vibrations, making future prey easier to detect on them. Making these alterations to its web, Cyclosa octotuberculata offloads some of the burden of cognition to its environment. It expels its current knowledge and memory into a compact yet meaningful physical form, making a mark on the world that can guide its future actions. The interacting system of the spider and its web is smarter than the spider could hope to be on its own. This outsourcing of intellect to the environment is known as extended cognition. Mathematics is a form of extended cognition. When a scientist, mathematician, or engineer writes down an equation, they are expanding their own mental capacity. They are offloading their knowledge of a complicated relationship onto symbols on a page. By writing these symbols down, they leave a trail of their thinking for others and for themselves in the future. Cognitive scientists hypothesize that spiders and other small animals rely on extended cognition because their brains are too limited to do all the complex mental tasks required to thrive in their environment. We are no different. Without tools like mathematics, our ability to think and act effectively in the world is severely limited. Mathematics makes us better in some of the same ways written language does, but mathematics goes beyond everyday language because it is a language that can do real work. The mechanics of mathematics, the rules for rearranging, substituting, and expanding its symbols are not arbitrary. They are a systematic way to export the process of thinking to paper or machines. Alfred Whitehead, a revered 20th century mathematician whose work we will encounter in chapter three, has been paraphrased as saying, quote, the ultimate goal of mathematics is to eliminate any need for intelligent thought. Given this useful feature of mathematics, some scientific subjects, physics chief among them, have developed an ethos centered on rigorous quantitative thinking. Scientists in these fields have capitalized on the power of mathematics for centuries. They know that mathematics is the only language precise and efficient enough to describe the natural world. They know that the specialized notation of equations expertly compresses information, making an equation like a picture. It can be worth a thousand words. They also know that mathematics keeps scientists honest. When communicating through the formalism of mathematics, assumptions are laid bare and ambiguities have nowhere to hide. In this way, equations force clear and coherent thinking. As Bertrand Russell, a colleague of Whitehead, whom we will also meet in chapter three, wrote, quote, everything is vague to a degree you do not realize till you have tried to make it precise. The final lesson that quantitative scientists have learned is that the beauty of mathematics lies in its ability to be both specific and universal. An equation can capture exactly how the pendulum and the barometrical clock on the minister's landing at Buckingham Palace will swing. The very same equation describes the electrical circuits responsible for broadcasting radio stations around the world. When an analogy exists between underlying mechanisms, equations serve as the embodiment of that analogy. As an invisible thread tying together disparate topics, mathematics is a means by which advances in one field can have surprising and disproportionate impacts on other far-flung areas. Biology, including the study of the brain, has been slower to embrace mathematics than some other fields. A certain portion of biologists, for reasons good and bad, have historically eyed mathematics with some skepticism. In their opinion, mathematics is both too complex and too simple to be of much use. Some biologists find mathematics too complex because, trained as they are in the practical work of performing lab experiments and not in the abstract details of mathematical notation, they see lengthy equations as meaningless scribble on the page. Without seeing the function in the symbols, they'd rather do without them. As biologist Yuri Lezebnik wrote in a 2002 plea for more mathematics in his field, quote, in biology, we use several arguments to convince ourselves that problems that require calculus can be solved with arithmetic if one tries hard enough and does another series of experiments. Yet mathematics is also considered too simple to capture the overwhelming richness of biological phenomena. An old joke amongst physicists highlights the sometimes absurd level of simplification that mathematical approaches can require. The joke starts with a dairy farmer struggling with milk production. After trying everything he could think to get his beloved cows to produce more milk, he decides to ask the physicist at the local university for help. The physicist listens carefully to the problem and goes back to his office to think. After some consideration, he comes back to the farmer and says, I found a solution. First, we must assume a spherical cow in a vacuum. Simplifying a problem is what opens it up to mathematical analysis. So inevitably, some biological details get lost in translation from the real world to the equations. As a result, those who use mathematics are frequently disparaged as being too disinterested in those details. In his 1897 book, Advice for a Young Investigator, Santiago Ramón y Cajal, the father of modern neuroscience whose work is discussed in chapter nine, 
wrote about these reality avoiding theorists in a chapter entitled Diseases of the Will. He identified their symptoms as, quote, a facility for exposition, a creative and restless imagination, an aversion to the laboratory, and an indomitable dislike for concrete science and seemingly unimportant data. Cahal also lamented the theorist's preference for beauty over facts. Biologists study living things that are abundant with specific traits and nuanced exceptions to any rule. Mathematicians, driven by simplicity, elegance, and the need to make things manageable, squash that abundance when they put it into equations. Oversimplification and an obsession with aesthetics are legitimate pitfalls to avoid when applying mathematics to the real world. Yet at the same time, the richness and complexity of biology is exactly why it needs mathematics. So then the chapter goes on to uh, provide more argument for why biology does need mathematics and why in particular the study of the brain needs mathematics uh, and how the book will explain all of that in many detail over the next uh, 11 chapters. Yeah, that's a beautiful section, Grace, and I think it really uh, it really shows a couple of the qualities of your writing that I think make the book so compelling. And one is the ability to kind of weave in cool anecdotes like the like the spider's web, and the other is telling your story in terms of the people that were participants in the in the journey. One of the one of the moments I was particularly I, I loved was bringing up James Gleick's book on chaos. So for my generation, uh, that was the book, right, that maybe will have the, the kind of, your book will have the, the same kind of influence because that, I read that in college and it totally transformed my my excitement about about going into nonlinear dynamics. And part of it that it was, it was based around the people, right? There were these crazy characters who were working on chaos and you know, they, the, the, the story was kind of told through through their eyes. So I was wondering with, with your book, you know, choice of, people, right, to highlight and to tell stories about is a little bit of politics there as well, right, as well as the, the kind of narrative drive of, of who, to, who to highlight. And I wonder if you could just tell us more about, about your choices of sort of who to zoom in on and, and tell, tell stories about. Yeah, so I started with, you know, the topics that I wanted to cover, of course. Um, and so for that, I kind of looked through, I mean, I've been in the field for a while, so I had some sense of the major areas um, that computational neuroscience focuses on. And I was looking through various textbooks to just make sure I wasn't getting too biased in, in the topic areas that, that I wanted to write about. Um, and then from there, it was a matter of kind of finding some keystone uh, publications and doing some tracing of, you know, what do they cite and what cites them and trying to create this narrative. And so, you know, some of the people, some of the names involved, you know, if I'm going to do a, a chapter on memory and Hopfield networks, I'm going to talk about John Hopfield. <laughs> um, so you have to, to do that. Um, but then, you know, when you move away from the the kind of main pieces, then you have a little bit more choice in, in who you're covering. And that was a combination of, you know, who seemed to honestly be influencing things at the time. But then there's also an element of who has information available about them. Some of these people wrote autobiographies or other, you know, people wrote about them, or there are historians who have published a lot about them. Um, and so that certainly helps, you know, it, it, I was more inclined to include people that you could actually say something about <laughs> um, so that you could get a personal side to things. Um, and then I also, but I, I also wanted to not just write about the people who seemed obvious to me and that everyone would know about. So I was trying to keep an open mind um, when looking, you know, if there was someone that, that I didn't know much about or hadn't heard much about, but um, had a lot to kind of include on the personal side that definitely came into it. Um, but yeah, it's, it definitely is a mix of all of those things and it wasn't always easy to, to decide uh, what to include and what not to include. Who, who was your favorite new person that you got to know? Through um, I really like Jerry Letvin. He wrote, he's in the vision chapter. He wrote the paper, um, What the Frog's Eye Tells the Brain, or Frog's Retina Tells the Brain. Um, and yeah, he just seemed like he had an interesting mix of interests. He was like a practicing psychiatrist. And um, he also just was like kind of depressive in a way. He referred to himself as a, he referred to himself as an overweight slob. And he um, had this uh, debate with, um, there's the professor who was really a big advocate for LSD. 
I can't remember his name now. This isn't in the book. This is just a side point about Jerry Lepin. But he did a debate where he tried to argue that LSD is bad, but he, he was... Um, he wasn't the first person who was supposed to do it. The person who was supposed to do it dropped out. And so he just like jumped in because he liked to debate, but he didn't really care about LSD. <laughs> so I don't know. He just seemed like a fun character. <laughs> that, my, my next question would have been, who's your favorite? Who, who's the first person who you couldn't write about? Like what are, what are the, what's the stories that you couldn't include in the book? Like clearly the LSD story doesn't have a place in a computational neuroscience book probably, but uh, were there favorites like that that you had to leave out? I think so. There was a lot. Another person that I enjoyed was um, Herman von Helmholtz, and there was I just read a fair amount about him and stuff, and there were just things about him that it seemed nice to talk about. Um, not any crazy stories or anything like that, but that was someone who I didn't actually put in so much about his life. Um, but he he he's very influential in a lot of different fields, and it would be interesting to uh, to know more about him and read more about him, I think. So does that mean there's going to be a follow up? Uh, I'm sure that someone else has already written a Helmholtz biography. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I, I have a specific question about um, your uh, cracking the neural code chapter. Um, that you didn't read about. Uh, read, obviously, it's in the later um, stages of your book. Um, it's page uh, 190 something. Um, I found it peculiar knowing that you started your neuroscience career in Freiburg, um, where the idea of the Sinfire chain, so the idea of very synchronous spike packets that travel along very designated uh, lines of communication in neural networks. Uh, was very prominent at the time that you were there, especially uh, you left it out completely uh, out of your book. Uh, and so um, you talked about the neural code more in sort of the terms of adaptation and uh, in a much more sort of maybe nebulous way, I should say, but didn't dive into the mechanics. Is there a reason for that? Is that an implicit saying, you know, we're over the Sinfire chain idea. This is, I would, I would, I would love to hear that, obviously. Um, but yeah, what, what was your reasoning behind leaving out Sinfire chains and, and rate mode um, well, propagation? Well, I do talk about spike timing based codes. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I guess you could say that the, the Sinfire chain is a way of propagating and that's relevant to, to communication and all that. Um, I mean, also at some point it's, it is a, it's supposed to be a general audience book and uh, you have to, you know, put in as much as you think people will be very interested to read. And uh, yeah, the, in terms of, so there are some, you know, personal anecdotes I wasn't able to get in, but in terms of technical details that I wasn't able to get in, that is a whole other book, obviously many different textbooks uh, on that. But yeah, that wasn't a personal slight against the Sinfire chain or anyone who studies it. It's just a, a matter of what will be of possibly most interest to the audience. Hmm. Yeah, you had a very interesting phrasing to me and uh, when you when you were talking about oscillations, you, you used the, the phrase, neuroscientists have devised countless ways in which oscillations could help the brain. And I, I wondered if you think about that more generally as kind of the key role of theorists to devise explanations you know, for, for phenomenology and whether whether in general those explanations are plausible or falsifiable. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's um, kind of a back and forth that is throughout the history of, of computational neuroscience and throughout the book as a result is just that people are going to come in and say things, you know, they're going to say, especially when you're working off of analogies to other um, things that have good mathematical modeling around them. So something like oscillations, where we have a lot of math built up around that, I think it really draws people with a mathematical background in to be like, oh, okay, here's something I can really, you know, get my hands around, and then try to further the neuroscience as a result. Um, and even in, you know, the original use of um, using electrical circuits as, you know, an analogy for how neurons work and using the same math for that. I mean, that's just people coming in and saying, it kind of looks like this is what's happening. I'm going to assert that this corresponds to that and see where I can go with it. 
And, um, you know, the book focuses a lot on the successes of that, <laughs> where someone comes in and says, I think this works like that. And then we do more experiments and it does support it. Um, but there are also, you know, caveats. I mean, in the field, generally, there are plenty of times where that doesn't work. It's just it doesn't make as interesting of a story when it doesn't work. Um, but I also try to include the times where it, it doesn't work a little bit in the book as well, because that is, yeah, that is what theory is supposed to be, is uh, offering a guess, so to speak, um, but ideally a mathematically formalized guess so that it can be more testable. So for the oscillation example that Adrian shows, you sort of have a proxy, this, this, uh, you know, get rid of oscillations. You, you introduce oscillations at the end of your balance chapter, and then um, you interview someone and they say, you know, ah, it's just the exhaust fumes from the car. Um, but as you frame oscillations as the end of your balance, you know, what, what excitation inhibition are striving towards, these populations of synapses that are working in sync, you then don't offer a, another perspective uh, on what balance of excitation inhibition are doing. Is that by design? Wh where, where do you stand with that? Um, I, so yeah, the way that that chapter is laid out is that I first kind of describe, well, first I describe excitation and inhibition, um, and then this notion of them being in this tight balance. Um, but there, the main benefit of what that balance could be that I wanted to highlight was um, the, you know, ability to have a quick, large response to, to um, incoming input. Um, which is something that, you know, people who, who study this uh, note as, as a benefit of having that kind of tight balance. Um, so I felt like that was the, the main benefit to highlight, um, again, because it is the main, one of the big benefits that's studied, and also because it felt, you know, after <laughs> a chapter that's kind of dense with some details that people might not, you know, relate to as much as they do chapters on mem memory or motor control or something, <laughs> I didn't want to go too deep into the weeds of other benefits of uh, balance. But also, no, the, the oscillations, um, uh, I, I want to believe that I also represented the areas where there's kind of no controversy about oscillations being relevant, like in sleep and that kind of thing. Um, and so I, yeah, again, I, I wanted to get the whole spread and also the point of you know, I brought someone else's quote in is very relevant to me because the book is not in first person. It's not like, here's what I think about the brain. <laughs> it is a true effort to represent the thought that is out there um, with other people's, you know, ideas mixed in to prove that I'm representing it uh, in, in as objective a way as I could. Obviously, I made choices about what to include and how to include them and what to emphasize and all of that. But I wanted it to be based on things that people in the field have said and not just what I think. Yeah, you've really taken the opportunity to kind of take this bird's eye view of the field and I uh, yeah, really love that. And I, I also appreciate very much that you've tried to keep your um, your own perspective at a minimum and represent the views of many people in the field. I was interested by your chapter on memory, but you're very theory forward where you start with the idea of attractors and and um, it's this sort of sense that that, that is salt, that is how memory works in a way. And I, I, I wonder if you, you know, if you feel like it, it would be, um, there are other op op opportunities for, for different ideas that could be brought in there, or if there's the possibility that theory sometimes is so beautiful and compelling that it forms an attractor of its own and we get a bit sort of caught into, into ideas that then become hard to, hard to shape. Yeah, I think that's interesting because, you know, when you um, uh, when you find a theory that works decently well and uh, you can um, apply it and make experimental predictions based on it and all of that, uh, that is sorry. I think I'm getting an echo again. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, so that is. Um, Again, that's kind of the easy thing to highlight. Um, and then, but the idea of, you know, theory overreach or kind of theory creep, where you start applying a theory that works really well in this very certain circumstance to try to explain everything or just try to use it um, beyond its means by um, not realizing that it's, you know, an abstract um, uh, model. Uh, I think that, um, yeah, it's, it's almost harder to identify that in the literature, the overreach side, just because what will happen maybe is someone will try to do that and then it won't really work that well and then they won't be cited or you know, no one is building off of that. There are some examples though where people explicitly push back and this is 
like in writing the book, I just want to encourage more explicit papers of this kind um, <laughs> where you write a review or a perspective article that's really just kind of like, eh, you know, this is good. This theory does have some good things, but let's be careful because when it's been applied here and here, it's been taken a little out of context and it's a little less tight of an analogy and it's not doing as much work. And a place where that did happen is um, in Bayesian uh, perception models. There is a lot of explicit discussion about how useful is it to uh, model perception as a Bayesian inference problem, and is that falsifiable and all of these things. And so in the book, I do include, you know, the pushback to it as being applied, you know, too much and, you know, maybe losing any ability to actually say something interesting as a result. Um, so yeah, for future book writers, people should just really explicitly state some nice controversial opinions um, on prominent theories in papers, and then also write an autobiography where you gossip about all your coworkers. That would be great too. <laughs> um, Grace, what I what I failed to um, tell about you in the intro, and what is important for the next question, uh, is that we have another connection also shared with Adrian, and that. Uh, we spend a good time together every year or for the last um, two years before the pandemic uh, in Miesenberg in South Africa where um, uh, you are a teaching assistant or you have been a teaching assistant um, helping uh, out to uh, teach computational neuroscience. And um, our next question is coming from another TA at the course, uh, Chris Curran, uh, who I think is in the background. Let me see if I can bring him back. There he is. Um, hi, Chris. I saw that you had a question, so I called you up on screen. Awesome. Thanks. Chris Grace, really enjoying the book, um, particularly enjoying the, the history chapters and how you frame exist, like things we, we know that scientists uh, discovered and framing it in the sense of the mathematical understanding and not just the biological understanding. What I did notice as well is that psychologists and cognitive neuroscientists have played an important role in the early understanding of the brain and indeed artificial intelligence. So why do you think these fields have contributed so much? And importantly, how do you think they're going to contribute to our mathematical understanding of the brain moving forward? Um, yeah, so yeah, I think you can see a lot of the influence from what we would now think of as more cognitive science, cognitive neuroscience, even in the very early days of artificial intelligence, because essentially the goal of artificial intelligence is to replicate cognition. So it makes sense that the people who are studying it more at that level, um, especially in the early days where there was really a bigger gulf between the people who studied the mind and the people who studied the brain, um, you know, those were the people that you cared to talk to if you wanted to replicate the mind in some sort of computer. Um, so I think just in terms of laying out what even the goal was when you're trying to make artificial intelligence and then also having some insights into kind of how you would break the problem down, um, you know, the, the, or the cognitive scientists of the time were very uh, helpful in that. And you can see that reflected in our early artificial intelligence because it's not neuron like, you know, artificial neural networks that we use now in the, the very early days and at various points in the history of artificial intelligence models that don't try to mimic neurons at all or, or what's in fashion. Um, and they're just trying to go directly for the mind by using, you know, logic and things like that. Um, and so uh, it, it was, you know, around the, the middle of the 20th century that these artificial neural models come about. And this notion that you can actually use, you know, the hardware of the brain to mimic the software or to run the software um, becomes more influential. And then through various ups and downs, we get to where we are today, where um, deep artificial neural networks are the, the major thing and have whatever level of inspiration and um, analogy to the brain that you want to describe it as. People have a lot of debates over um, how brain-like are artificial neural networks, but in the sense that they're at least based on neurons and they're connected nonlinear units, they are more brain-like than other types of artificial intelligence. Um, and yeah, going forward, I mean, I think it's an open question. A lot of the, I think in the, the chapter about vision in the book, you see the most um, of this kind of going back and forth where times where uh, neuroscience and artificial intelligence are really coming together and times where they diverge and do their own things. Um, and so in a way we're in a time where they're very close together now. Neuroscientists are using these models um, from artificial intelligence to model the brain and people who work on artificial intelligence are becoming more and more interested in knowing what we know about the brain. Um, 
I think there is a fear that the people working on artificial intelligence will find us out and realize that we don't know enough to really help them very explicitly. Um, but maybe they'll do what many quantitative people have done in the past and decide, you know what, I'm just going to work on the brain directly then and apply, you know, my sense of how models work to to study the brain directly so that we can more explicitly extract its useful properties into into models. <laughs> Can I quickly ask, there was a question from the audience, whether your book isn't generally a question, uh, a book about models of the brain rather than models of the mind. And you start your books, you know, talking about the duality and that being, there being a wall between psychology and, or mathematicians actually in that case, and, and, and people interested in the mind. Um, so where do you stand on that? Do you, st do you think there is still walls like that or uh, are they all gone? Well, I think the fact that the question is raised suggests that there's um, somewhat of a wall because, you know, it, yeah. So I understand why the word mind, you know, can seem different for, than the word brain. And in, in my perspective, I uh, would see using the word mind to describe something more akin to what psychologists study in the sense of looking at input and output, just what is that function and not caring about how the brain actually implements that function just generally at a more behavioral level, understanding patterns of actions and, and thoughts described at a higher level. Um, I think most modern neuroscientists and most modern psychologists would agree that the brain is what implements that input output function. And so by learning about the brain, you can perhaps better understand uh, those processes. Um, and so in my mind, they are the same at some level, they eventually become the same thing. Um, or in my brain, they become the same thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I understand that there are the, there is a use case for kind of using a different definition uh, for them. But in terms of what the book is about, um, yeah, so in the third chapter about the history of artificial neural networks, I do explicitly discuss the fact that basically the uh, invention of artificial neural networks, the proof that you could use brain-like things to do mind-like operations, was a big stepping stone, at least according to some people, in terms of breaking down that historical wall that did separate the mind and the brain. So it is through mathematical modeling that they became more similar or more um, explicitly connected. And then on top of that, I do just have some uh, models that are at the more psychological level in the book, like the Bayesian perception models and um, the associative learning models that turn into reinforcement learning and all of that. Those are solid, you know, psychological models in the history of, of mathematical modeling. Yeah, thanks, Chris, for bringing up the, the question about, about history. And in general, as we've talked about already a little bit here today, one of the beauties of, of Grace's book is the extent to which she, she delves into the history of many, many aspects of, of the neuroscience questions that are addressed in the book. So we thought we might give uh, another opportunity for those who haven't yet read the book to um, hear Grace read uh, from one of those one of those anecdotes that she shares. Grace, can I ask you to read just a little bit slower? Because as a non-native speaker, I sometimes, you know, had a had a hard time. Just a just a, you know, a little. Sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is just a short section I wanted to read from the second chapter, which is called How Neurons Get Their Spike. So it's about uh, single neuron modeling, and it kind of starts with the history of uh, people discovering that neurons do use electricity to communicate uh, and the kind of fight that had to happen to get everyone to accept that fact. Um, and then it gets into how uh, electrical circuits became, you know, an analogy for neurons and how you could map the bits of uh, a neuron, like its membrane potential to components in an electrical circuit, uh, which happened around the uh, early 1900s. So that's when the original um, uh, equivalent circuit models, as they're called, came about. And then um, the part that I want to read is a little bit about Hodgkin and Huxley, which I think imagine a lot of people in neuroscience know, um, Alan Hodgkin and Andrew Huxley did a bunch of experiments uh, to understand in more detail how the action potential occurs in a neuron, so how it has this um, shape in its membrane voltage as it uh, sends a message, 
and um, they did a bunch of experiments that led them to create a more refined equivalent circuit model to describe that process. And so that's what um, this section is going to be about. Having defined the equations of this circuit, Hodgkin and Huxley wanted to churn through the numbers to see if the voltage across the model's capacitor really would mimic the characteristic wish and whoosh of an action potential. There was a problem, however. Cambridge was home to one of the earliest digital computers, a device that would have greatly sped up Hodgkin and Huxley's calculations, but it was out of service. So Huxley turned to a Brunsviga, a large metal calculator powered by a hand crank. As he sat for days, putting in the value of the voltage at one point in time, just to calculate what it would be at the next one ten thousandth of a second, Huxley actually found the work somewhat suspenseful. As he said in his Nobel lecture, quote, it was quite often exciting. Would the membrane potential get away into a spike or die in a subthreshold oscillation? Very often, my expectations turned out to be wrong. And an important lesson I learned from these manual computations was the complete inadequacy of one's intuition in trying to deal with a system of this degree of complexity. With the calculations complete, Hodgkin and Huxley had a set of artificial action potentials, the behavior of which formed a near perfect mirror image of a real neuron spike. When injected with current, the Hodgkin-Huxley model cell displays a complex dance of changing voltage and resistances. First, the input fights against the cell's natural state. It adds some positive charge to the largely negative inside of the cell. If this initial disturbance in the membrane's voltage is large enough, that is, if the threshold is met, sodium channels start opening and a glut of positively charged sodium ions flood into the cell. This creates a positive feedback loop. The influx of sodium ions pushes the inside of the cell more positive, and the resulting change in voltage lowers the sodium resistance even more. Soon, the difference in charge across the membrane disappears. The inside of the cell is briefly as positive as the outside, and then more so, the overshoot. As this is happening, potassium channels are opening, letting positively charged potassium ions fall out of the cell. The sodium and potassium channels work like saloon doors, one letting ions in and the other out but now the potassium ions are moving quicker. The work of the potassium ion reverses the trend in voltage. As this exodus of potassium again, again makes the inside of the cell more negative, sodium channels close. The separation of charge across the membrane is being rebuilt. As the voltage nears its original value, positive charge continues to leak out of the still open potassium channels, the undershoot. Eventually these two close. The voltage recovers and the cell has returned to normal, ready to fire again. The whole event takes less than one half of one one hundredth of a second. According to Hodgkin, the pair built this mathematical model because, quote, at first it might be thought that the response of a nerve to different electrical stimuli is too complicated and varied to be explained by these relatively simple conclusions. But explain it they did. Like a juggler, the neuron combines simple parts in simple ways to create a splendidly intricate display. The Hodgkin-Huxley model makes clear that the action potential is a delicately controlled explosion occurring a billion times a second in your brain. So the reason that I like that passage and those quotes from Hodgkin and Huxley is because I think that they uh, really highlight exactly what mathematical modeling is for. It's because your intuitions are insufficient to try to understand something as complicated, in their case, as complicated as a single neuron. So imagine trying to understand the brain without um, putting anything into mathematical modeling. And so I think it's very interesting, especially because the Hodgkin-Huxley model is, you know, kind of the standard model. Even people who don't consider themselves on the computational side in neuroscience generally still learn about and know about that model because that's just how an action potential works. So you have to learn that. Um, and so even in that case, in the model by the Nobel laureates who made it, uh, they couldn't even predict how it would behave. <laughs> so, and they they weren't sure in advance if this basic mechanism that they thought was leading to the shape of the action potential would actually produce it in the model that they built. So I just think that it's a really nice example of exactly what this, this line of work is for, uh, for understanding the brain. Yeah, I actually, <clears throat> I really love that quote that you read this, about the expectation not being true, how there is joy sort of in in both being wrong on the intuitive level, but then the same holds true further on when you build a model that's wrong and you see it sort of collapsing. Uh, it's similar uh, in that you're like, oh, there is more here. Um, and so uh, it's, it's, it's sort of this interesting interplay on like having a word model uh, for something and then 
learning more from the mathematical model, but then also being told wrong or being told off by the experiment time and again uh, as a modeler. I thought, you know, I, I really like that. Um, in that regard, I also I had a question. Um, you later come back to the action potential and you talk about how the action potential is all or nothing and how its shape doesn't communicate anything. And then in a footnote, you say, well, actually, you know, some people do believe that the shape of the action potential has an impact on uh, information transfer. Um, and so no matter where you stand on whether action potentials are all or nothing or not, uh, I was wondering what are, if you came across any theories as you're doing your literature research that you wish had been true or, uh, uh, you know, or the other way around, whether there's any theories that you think are definitely not going to hold up or that are going to going to be sort of the, um, you know, the box theory, every model is wrong and some are useful. What's the most useful wrong theory that, uh, that you like? Um, choose one of the two. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So they are all wrong in their own ways, their own beautiful, unique ways. Um, I do think that the, uh, the attractor, which we've talked about many times, is a very nice example of a theory that you just want to be right because it's so pretty and elegant and it seems like it serves the purpose. You know, it seems like, um, for people who don't know, this is a, a mathematical model of memory that just can explain both how memories get reactivated and get completed, but then also how they stay in your mind for working memory. It just has a lot of components that are very pleasant, um, in terms of just the breadth of experimental data it could possibly explain. And then also just mathematically, there are these nice, uh, simple objects. And so that's something that you definitely want to be right. And, you know, seems to be right to an extent, um, but almost certainly has caveats and complications uh, that we'll discover down the line. Um, so I think that's definitely one of them. And I'm trying to think if there are any other really clean ones that I'm disappointed by how little they explain. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not sure. So I think, uh, you know, there's an interesting thing going on now in terms of um, biological backpropagation. So how do, um, how do networks of neurons learn? How do they get better at a certain task? And we know how we can make that happen in artificial neural networks, but that doesn't seem to be the exact way that they're happening in that, that the process is happening in um, in biological networks. And so I think there's um, an interesting aspect there of, you know, this case where the, the math and the engineering are leading the neuroscience in a way, like people in neuroscience are literally using the phrase biological backpropagation. That is the target of their research, um, which wouldn't happen if we didn't have artificial neural networks that are trained with backpropagation. That's where it comes from, the idea that we should talk about that at all. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I would like if we, through that interface, come up with a very nice way for real networks of neurons to implement something that is very similar to backpropagation, because that's what people are looking for now. And it's leading people to really explore interesting details of anatomy in these neurons about where they're getting what kind of inputs and how that could change the way that those inputs are combined by the cell and change their um, the strengths of the connections between the cells. And I just think it would be really nice if this this round of artificial intelligence influence in neuroscience led to something as concrete as um, kind of figuring out how the brain does certain types of learning in an area where we were, I think, a little bit uh, kind of stagnant in, in understanding that. It would be very fun to me if, if that's what this round of um, the merging of AI and neuroscience led to. And I assume we'll have another wave where it fades away and we get another merging um, and we'll see what we learn from that one. <laughs> Well, jumping from the action potential out to sort of the end of the book, where you make a really brave attempt to to try to understand where we're at in terms of grand unified theories. So you were appropriately skeptical, I think, on the on the variants that are out there. But I did wonder a bit. Um, you, I felt like you might have pulled your punches a bit on the on the issue of large scale simulation. The the one caveat you gave to that as a route to understanding was the scale, you know, that, that can you possibly build one that's big enough? Is that really your, your entire critique or do you know, do you, maybe you could expand more on your thoughts about, about large scale simulation as a, as a route to, to understanding the brain? 
Yeah, so um, yeah, so at the end of the the chapter on the grand unified theories, I do yeah compare kind of human brain project like approaches to um, um, to other types of large scale approaches, and one in particular that I talk about is Spawn, which is this you know multi brain area model, um, which is also a large scale model. Um, and in that way, these are kind of models that aren't these grand unified theories because the grand unified theories are usually supposed to be very simple and compact and they just explain everything with a few simple principles, whereas these models are more like, let's put it all together, let's put everything we know together and see what happens. Um, so I think, I think the issue of, you know, scale and building something big enough uh, there's a technical element to that, but there's also an element of it that is against the spirit of modeling. Um, and so it's not just could you technically build a bigger and bigger model, it's this question of what are you learning by building the model and what core principles are you identifying um, by building the model if you don't whittle your data, data down in any way, if you really are just putting everything you know in there, then uh, you're not really utilizing one of what is supposed to be the benefits of modeling, which is where you find what matters and what do doesn't matter. And you can say, in order to explain this bit of data, I only need these three things. Um, if you just put everything in there, then you don't have that opportunity to draw that conclusion. Uh, and so I think in that way, it is that that is one of the issues with with that approach uh, to modeling in, in terms of really being a useful model versus just kind of an exercise you can try to do. Apologies for having to get up. I was actually running out of power in a dramatic way, but I did hear your answer. So thank you. And uh, thank you, Adrian, for catching me so gracefully. Um, I wanted to um, ask you if you were, do you think you would be, it seems like you're very soft in your criticism of almost anything. Um, so you're, you're, uh, you're, very, yeah, very gentle, I would say. Um, and do you think this is, I mean, this is a difficult question to answer, obviously, but is that a function of your um, youth in the field? Do you think when you're going to rewrite the same book in 50 years from now, are you going to be much harsher and curmudgeon? Or is it your general nature that you're, um, that you don't harshly criticize? Um, well, we'll see what happens in 20 years and who will be the target of <laughs> my next book. Um, yeah, I, so that's interesting feedback. I mean, I, again, I wanted it to be a somewhat objective covering of the field. And if there's an area that a lot of people are working on, um, then in an objective sense, you know, that is an area of interest that is something that, that people think might work out a certain way. And so I didn't want to overly influence the reader by, again, putting too much of my own um, opinions into it. I, I want to believe that I still included the critiques as they were you know, necessary. Um, and because the critiques themselves can be interesting examples of the benefits of modeling. So for example, there's a chapter on network neuroscience and this use of graph theory to understand um, the brain. So just kind of looking at core structure to under understand function. And that's getting a lot of attention these days, but um, there's an interesting kind of counterpoint to that notion of just looking at structure to understand function, which comes from the work of Eve Martyr and the many simulations that she's done to show that structure alone can't tell you anything because the same structure can be doing different things in different circumstances and different structures can be doing the same thing. So that is a case where it was very, uh, easy and fun to kind of tie together these somewhat disparate regions of, of mathematical approaches um, because one is a good kind of, not to say wet blanket, but a little bit of a caution against the other. Um, so yeah, I, I, I tried to include the necessary criticisms, again, by using the words and work of, of other people to prove that it wasn't just my intuition. But yeah, maybe in 20 or 30 years, my intuition will feel important enough <laughs> to write a book based on it. So I wanted to pick up a couple of the questions in the chat. You know, there are a number of people who are curious of kind of about the mechanics of writing. So which which chapters were the easiest and the hardest to write? Who were the authors that, that most inspired you, scientists and non-scientists? Um, 
Yeah, so I didn't write the book in order, and I kind of, I didn't do this intentionally, but I realized as I was getting towards the end of my writing process that I had uh, unknowingly saved some of the harder chapters for the end, because I would just kind of pick which chapter I wanted to write when I was ready to write another one, and yeah, I left some of the, the less pleasant ones towards the end. I would say... For a variety of reasons, one of the hardest chapters to write was the um, excitation and inhibition chapter, because most of the chapters have a somewhat clear tie-in to things that people would already know about, like memory, artificial intelligence, vision, these kinds of things. And so it was easy to get started in the chapter and then be like, hey, here's some weird bits you didn't know, and here's how math influenced it and all of that. The EI balance chapter is kind of like, well, if you didn't know, there are two different cell types <laughs> in the brain, these excitatory ones and these inhibitory ones. And also the brain is like noisy. So it's not doing the same thing all the time. And that's weird. So it was, you know, a weird concept to explain. And it was explained in terms that, you know, maybe not everyone was already aware of. So that one was just technically tricky to communicate to a broad audience. And that was the chapter that I did the most revisions on to try to get it into um, a format that could be both interesting and intelligible. Um, the motor chapter was a little bit difficult to write, and I think this maybe comes across because it feels like motor control, the study of motor control is in a weird state right now. And so that chapter didn't have like a nice arc of, oh, we were confused and now we understand. It's kind of like, we were confused, we understood a little bit, we got kind of confused again. Um, maybe we understand some stuff, but we could still do a lot more here. <laughs> so and for that reason, the motor chapter was a little bit uh, difficult to write. Um, and uh, yeah, in terms of kind of people that, uh, you know, writers that I looked to, um, as you mentioned before, Adrian, James Glick's uh, Chaos book was really interesting to read and his writing is just very uh, flowy for a topic that is, you know, complex and mathematical. So that was definitely um, something to look to to say, hey, this is possible. <laughs> I can I can try to do this. Another question that came from the audience was, when did you know the book was done in terms of technical writing? March 31st, 2020, when it was contractually obligated to be done. <laughs> um, yeah, I. so somewhat surprisingly to me and the other writers that I know, I did actually finish the book on time without an extension. Um, and uh, I guess I'm not... I, I'm empirically, I guess, not a perfectionist. <laughs> um, I understood that it was going to be what it was. And, um, you know, there's always more things you can try to fix. But I tried to keep myself to a pretty solid schedule throughout the whole process. So I, I signed the contract to write the book in 2018. Um, so that's kind of a year and a half of writing, almost two years of writing. Um, and, yeah, I, I tried to keep myself to a strict schedule. And I had a... Um, uh, my kind of internal guide was I'm not done with the first draft of a chapter until it's in a form where if it were published, I wouldn't need to dig my head into the sand. Like it had to be, even the first draft had to be up to a point where like I could handle this going out. Um, and so staying on that kind of, I think it's easy to be like, eh, this is a first draft. I'll just kind of do whatever. And then you get yourself into a situation where it's hard to fix it. And, you know, you're, you end up writing portions that you don't even use and all of that. So I just made a point of kind of getting the first draft of each chapter to something that was acceptable to some degree and then refining it. Um, and so I think that that helped, uh, both to make it feel manageable. Like when I was done with the first draft of a chapter, I could honestly feel kind of done, even though I knew I would send it out to people to read and there would be revisions and everything. It wasn't like weighing on me all the time and it let me drop that all of that content matter and focus on the next chapter, uh, which was helpful. I guess we should move toward wrapping up, but Tim and I both had a question for you that, that came up through our reading, That's sort of about the field and the dynamics of the field, you know, definitely reading the book, you know, seeing so many friends and, you know, and heroes, and it, it does raise a lot of, a lot of questions along these lines. So one that uh, I wanted to ask you is that, you know, I, I loved that you mentioned Robert Merton's work on multiple discoveries. So for those who don't know, this was really important sociology work that was done maybe in the 50s, pointing out how often it is that the same discovery happens multiple times, that, that people sort of hit on the same ideas 
at the same time. And that has led to really bitter debates and feuds between people who feel like they're being ripped off and screwed. You know, did you, in your research, do you feel like you saw that a lot or that you can generally trace a line to the hero right, who came up with the, the next idea? Yeah, I, so it definitely came up sometimes, and I'm sure it it exists more in the topic matter in the book than I even know about because you know uh, it's hard to find the alternative histories, so to speak, of um, how things could have gone if someone else was given the main credit for something. Um, I know there's um, uh, with uh, Hebb and his theories of learning. There was a Polish scientist who wrote something very similar um, the year before. But a lot of the cases that I saw, especially in kind of the older history of these, you know, two people coming up with something similar at the same time, there was usually some sort of geographical divide where you could honestly see how they didn't really interact or people would know much more about one person than the other. Um, and then, you know, through the social networks of who knows who, uh, one person's um, influence becomes much more, much more known in the history. Um, so yeah, I think, I mean, it, it definitely happens in neuroscience and in theorizing because, uh, it, it, you know, it's, a little, it's cheap to theorize. You, you don't need a big lab. And so it seems very possible for people who are, you know, maybe taking in the same, uh, discoveries of the day to then come up with the same theories, which is great for science. It kind of gives you some verification that this is likely, you know, a good path to go down if people are independently coming to it, but very tricky for the politics of science where we want to assign credit to a person. And depending on how influential that theory becomes, it's quite a lot of credit and it really matters quite a lot. So yeah, it's, it's very tricky. Uh, Grace, I have one more question, um, but before we get there, I just wanted to quickly say uh, the book, the signed copy of your book uh, goes to Dale Zhu. Uh, so congratulations, Dale, uh, from uh, UPenn. Uh, we'll get in touch with you and see how we send you the book and if you want a personal message in your book from uh, Grace. Um, and then I, I wanted to, I actually have two questions, but maybe... Uh, the first, the, the question is um, the real question. Uh, in your book, what shines through your book is a romanticism about science, right? Like finding the action potential and, uh, you know, making grand unifying theories and um, really the joy of going out there and finding new knowledge shines through uh, in almost every page by your this really nice mix of explaining the core principles of something and then combining them with storytelling about the people. Um, and if you go on Twitter today, uh, it doesn't seem like much of that is left in science. People mostly rant about working conditions and cheap labor and unpaid labor and the pain of knowledge finding and the pain of being, do you think that we're looking back at this time with rose-tinted glasses, or do you think we're going to look back at today again with rose-tinted glasses in 50 years from now? Um, is there a remedy to this uh, conveyor beltization of science that that, or or is this just Twitter ranting? Uh, I think I think you need to learn about how to moderate your own Twitter feed because there's a mute button if you're really annoyed. <laughs> but uh... I, fair, I'm not so much annoyed as sort of flabbergasted, right? But yeah. because I I, I feel like I feel quite privileged in that I've been I've never had that experience of being abused by my advisor in a way um, uh, for cheap labor at least. Um, and uh, and and it seems like this is a very maybe it's just loud voices, but um, but is science still romantic today? Yeah, and I think if you look back, you can find plenty of uh, squabbles and fights, and um, yeah, you know, I I think there's a footnote in the motor control chapter about a citation argument where. Um, one of the figures refused to cite the other one, even though they knew he was doing relevant work out of spite. Um, so I think there's always been that. And there's also that um, famous Darwin quote where he was writing to someone who was like, I feel very poorly and stupid today. It's just like everyone struggled at all times in science. And so we still struggle today. But I think, yeah, the future will still look back and 
highlight the key discoveries and the people, you know, even within a lifetime, people look back on their own discoveries and like them much more. You know, when someone gives um, their Nobel speech, they're usually pretty cheery and romantic about it uh, for the most part. Although that can vary a lot by person. Sometimes it reads like a scientific manuscript. But um, so, yeah, I think my guess is we're just hearing more of everyone's thoughts. Um, but the thoughts have always been the same and our habit to consolidate uh, you know, the good later on, especially if we end up coming out on top of things, I think that will remain as well. I think it's just part of it. That's hopeful, right? Um, Grace, one more question. Um, I know you've TA'd also at uh, Neuromatch last year, is that right? Uh, I was on the executive board. I did oh, okay. Um, are you gonna be in, involved in Neuromatch again this year? Will the audience members have a chance to interact with you at Neuromatch is my question, because there were some people that uh, asked about where to learn neuroscience best if they're coming from the outside, and obviously Neuromatch would be probably the easiest access to that. Um, are you going to be part of that again this year? I am personally not part of it, but I would definitely recommend that people go to that. Uh, the TAs don't need me there to be good at it. <laughs> I did not contribute to the success of the teaching so <laughs> uh, last right. year. So I think it'll be just as good this year. All right. Good, good. Okay, Adrian, um, you you have any more questions? Or... No more questions. I think we probably really need to, to let people go. So I would love to thank you so much, Grace, for taking the time to spend with us today. I hope people got their questions answered in the chat. And if not, do follow up. Um, I'm sure Grace would be happy to, to answer some emails if there are things that got, that got missed. So thank yeah, you. thank you again, Grace. Thank you. Yeah, this was It was lovely. Answer. All right, we'll uh, end the broadcast here. So thanks, Grace. Thanks everyone for joining yeah. us. Bye.